Sean Gordon, we saw your uh, appearance there in, in front of the one, the many parliamentary processes that we've seen over the last more than a decade. Similar question to what I asked Peter Credlin. If it was less less ambitious, say something like a, a recognition and then maybe legislate the voice parallel to that, would that have got the, the greatest support? Look, it's, 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 it's easy to look at, at things in hindsight, but I, I think I, I go back to the, to the position I raised earlier on. If you're going to recognise a particular group of people, isn't it only right that you ask those people as to how you want them to be recognised? Indigenous people went through that process and made it clear that they wanted to be recognised for a practical measure, for a voice. Um, it's now been tested by the Australian people. We'll find out today whether it gets up or, or doesn't get up. Um, but it's pointless putting something to the Australian people that Indigenous people don't support. That's, that's I think, the failure of past governments and the, and the failure of current governments is that we, we develop ideas out of Canberra and capital cities. We then put it out into Indigenous communities without consulting Indigenous people. This is what The Voice is about. It's about consulting with Indigenous people to get their input in regards to what is going to work for them in their communities. Uh, yeah, well, it, absolutely. It, and I, I get that point, but just to go to Chris Kenny on this, because we saw you in the package as well, and, and it, it's something you wrote about in the paper again today, which seems like a pivotal decision by the Yes campaign and the government to not have the detail out there. Yeah, that, that's a mistake, in my view, of Anthony Albanese's, absolutely, because if you put more detail there, sure, you get a, a very detailed debate about it, but you control that and you're entrusting the electorate with information. What he did was leave a vacuum there. A bit, there was some detail, but there, there was a vacuum in the public debate which allowed the dishonest and deceptive scare campaign from the coalition really go, it was able to go carte blanche. And when you look at that little potted history there, and sure, you could do four hours on this, and it goes back many decades before 2007, but you see a lot of bipartisan work, mm. a lot of work with both sides of politics and Indigenous uh, groups and representatives until you get to David Littleproud in November last year and Peter Dutton in April this year kissing goodbye to that bipartisanship and saying that they'll hard oppose this thing. And that's what we've got to grapple with here. They have to wear responsibility as well because if this thing is divisive on principle, if the voice is racially divisive on principle, which they now argue and which has been so effective with the community in this referendum campaign, then why didn't they oppose it the very day after Anthony Albanese won election and promised to put a referendum? Why didn't they oppose it in July last year when he announced the wording at Gama? They waited... They toyed with it, they played the politics and they have opposed this outright for partisan political gain. Well, that's nonsense. <laughs> uh, let, let, let's be, be candid. If you, if you go through the history of this, uh, where bipartisanship was lost is when you got away from recognition to confiding it with another layer of bureaucracy. Now, well, just um, with, no, no, with all due respect, mate, um, you, you, I don't know how many days you've lived in outback Queensland or in central Australia... But we live with the consequences of the last time we had a representative body. We're the ones that bought the lived experience about last time we had a representative body. So why body. did and it, it take you five months to no, work out on a matter no, of principle with, because on. it was the wrong idea? So if you finish your editorial, I'll, I'll, I'll finish now. Um, so we went through a structured process whereby the Prime Minister made it very clear <laughs> that the detail that he was going to provide was the Karma Langton report, pages 14 to 16 from memory. That was the design that he said that he was going to take the Australian people. That is a representative body. That is the mistake that we are going to repeat if we pass this thing today for us in rural and remote Australia. Yet so what we no, 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 hold on, legislate a legislative body. Kill your, kill your jets. A representative this is, no, body. No, it's important you understand. It's important oh, you understand, understand the respectful way that the National Party went through this. So what we did is we respectfully sought both the yes and no case. And I spoke to Megan Davis and Arnie Pat also spoke to Warren Mundine. And we had a subcommittee within our party rank that then came back that got to that position on two key principles. Mm. One, we're repeating the mistake of the past of having a representative body. But secondly, we, we honestly believe, as a key tenet of our party, but of this great nation, that all 26 million of us are equal. And we all have an equal voice in that parliament through the 227 politicians. And proudly, our great nation has elected 11 Indigenous Australians, not to represent an Indigenous I, I, Australian, could, I, I think a critical point for David. And I think, so, so David, that's I think where we critical... got to our position. And we have not ha David, never I think raised critical... our voice at anybody in, in angst. About David, I think this, a critical point been, to make... We've been targeted personally. 
is it's your opinion that ATSIC failed in remote communities. But I can tell you the last term of ATSIC was delivering major benefits to Aboriginal communities right across the country. ATSIC was a vehicle that created wealth in Aboriginal communities. Since the abolishment of ATSIC, there has not been, you know, a, a single transfer of, of assets or, or purchase of assets that... that a transfer to the ownership of Indigenous And this is people. the problem with it. And, and this is for people... Chris, unfortunately, has never lived out there. When you talk you about... Know where I live talk there. about no, 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 this is a lived experience live. you've got to appreciate. But when you're talking about regional voices, in our practical experience, you're talking hundreds of thousands of square kilometres, sometimes millions of square kilometres. Then you are talking about hundreds of different diverse communities that what we would be doing is repeating the mistake of the past of sending a representative that doesn't even live in these communities and then get sending them to Canberra and letting the bureaucrats generalise and then nationalise programs. Right. How yeah. we actually close the gap in those rural and remote areas is we empower the local elder well, what you and, and getting the could bureaucrats I, out of Canberra. Can I just get to this point, there. David? I don't want to interrupt, but just to follow up, double barrel, barrel question on this. If a representative body for Indigenous Australians is racially divisive, why did it take five months after Anthony Albanese announced the wording for you to oppose it, and why does the coalition promise to legislate a representative voice? Well, well I don't, we're not promising... I'm not promising that, but it's this... You word, will oppose well, Peter Dutton's representative voice? Respect. So You've committed when prime, regional voices. When, when the Prime Minister made it clear that he wanted to go down this path, we gave him the opportunity <laughs> to put the detail... And so, as I said earlier, we respectfully explored. We respectfully explored both the yes and no cases of party room. We didn't do it in the public gaze but we did as a party room and drawn on our lived experience of what has worked and what hasn't in regional rural Australia. We had the respect to wait, and Peter Dutton, we couldn't wait for Peter Dutton. We felt it was right. We're, we are our own sovereign party, mm. and we made it very clear, and I made it very clear to our party... Can, can I just that respond when we in our, regards... Can I just respond position, in regards to the gonna, regional we're voices? We're going to be respectful in the debate... Can I just respond in regards to the regional voices? Empowered Communities was established by eight Indigenous communities around the country. I was the, I was the national convener for Empowered Communities from its inception until 2019, supported by a Tony Abbott government when Tony was elected. Don't... No, 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 and, no. And We've Tony, had this Tony, argument with Noel Pearson. Tony, Don't put Tony words in his signed mouth. off on Empowered Communities no. here in Sydney... No. ...supporting Empowered Communities, which was funded by Tony Abbott's government... And so a whole lot of revisionism around Stronger this people, table stronger places. Again, an initiative of a coalition government... Uh, local decision making, right in the in the Northern Territory, a CLP government. All of these different types of initiatives that have been rolled out have been rolled out by coalition governments, which are regional government structures, governance structures. These things have been power communities have been operating for ten years in Indigenous communities. Now ten Indigenous communities around the country, but signed off by an Abbott government. Uh, let me did, sorry. sorry, I just want to make a point though. When we talked earlier about that initial stage of, of starting the process of consultation with Aboriginal people, uh, about, to Sean's point and Chris Kenny's point, about what recognition might mean for them, not imposed from everyone else, coming up through Aboriginal communities, I agree that is correct. But the corollary of that was for them to be a whole series of conversations with non-Indigenous Australians in the early stages leading to a proper and... and um, orthodox constitutional convention about that idea meshed against the views of everybody else in the country and taken forward with jurists and legislators in, in the usual and way about and then put to the problem. Now, the problem is when Malcolm Turnbull came in, we only had the Aboriginal consultation. We never had a consultation with the Australian public. They've had that in the last few months. Um, whatever the result tonight, it's clear that they found that wanting and then they have delivered a verdict that may be hard to swallow tonight for people who believe in recognition. But this is the first time for about eight years non-Aboriginal Australians have had their say. That has been a fatal flaw in the process.